Hello, my friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of what are we talking about tonight? Well, we're going to talk about debt, the hidden costs of debt. So I was getting ready to say welcome to the uh, next episode of School of Wealth, but that comes, uh, I'm going to start recording the new episodes of the School of Wealth, which is the podcast that I started years ago. That was part of the podcast I actually started in 2010 when I started the radio show. So tonight we're going to be talking about the hidden costs of debt, specifically uh, five areas that cost you money with debt. Number one is interest rates. And I'm going to explain the difference between compound interest and simple interest or fixed interest. And then number two, we're going to talk about fees and penalties. People don't realize this, but the banks make billions of dollars. Yes, with a B, billions of dollars on fees and penalties. And you might think the bank doesn't want you to write bad checks, but actually they do because of the billion dollars that they can make from the fees. And then third, credit scores and future financial opportunities or loss of future financial opportunities due to bad credit and debt. And then fourth, it'll be the psychological and emotional toll of, of debt. I believe that money problems are the number one cause for divorce, the number one cause for illness, the number one cause for stress, the number one cause of death in America has to do with debt. Yes, I believe that. And I'll explain why. And then last, fifth, legal, aka lawsuits when it comes to debt. So those are the five things we're going to talk about tonight. So let's start with number one, and that's interest rates. Now there's compound interest and then there's fixed interest. And I really want to go over the difference because a lot of people don't understand the difference between compound interest and simple interest. In fact, there was a, uh, a video and I, I think it was Prager U that did it. And they were going out and they were interviewing people on the street saying, can you explain compound interest to me? And people just, they, they, they couldn't figure it out. So let's break it down. Fixed interest or simple interest rather, is an interest rate based on a fixed simple interest is interest only on the amount of debt or the principal. So if you borrow a thousand dollars and the interest rate is 10% interest for that entire year, you would think it would be, well, 10% of interest, 10% of $1,000 would be 100 bucks. So the interest that I'm going to pay for that year to borrow that $1,000 is $100. It's not, not accurate if you're making payments throughout the year. Now, if you borrowed $1,000 from someone with the balloon payment in 12 months and the interest rate is 10%, then you pay a hundred dollars. But if you got a loan from, let's say, a bank for one year, one thousand dollars at ten percent interest for one year, it would cost you twenty seven cents per day until you made a payment, and then it would actually go down. Now, why twenty seven cents a day? Well, if you take a thousand dollars. And times 10% interest, that would be a hundred bucks. You divide the hundred dollars by 365 days, it's 27 cents per day. So from day one to day 30, it's essentially going to be 27 cents a day. Then on your first payment, let's say you make a payment of a hundred dollars. The 27 cents a day times 30 days would go towards interest. The remaining would go towards principal. So let's just pull it up. I like to use this calculator. It's called Easy Calculators, and I use it every single day. And I know this seems like really basic stuff, but there's so many people that don't understand simple interest or compound interest that I just want to put it in here. So we're going to do one year. So $1,000. 10% interest for one year is going to cost you for the entire year $55.04. Now it's 10% interest. And this is where people get messed up. 
They think it's 10% is going to cost me 100. No, it only costs you 100 if it's a 12 months with no payments and you have a balloon payment. But you're going to be making payments on most of your loans. So it would cost you $55.04. The payment would be $87.92. Now, how did I come up with that? I, I put in the simple calculator. So $87.92, interest would only be $8.33, principal would be $79.59. So now after you make your first payment, you're only paying interest on $920. Then the following month, you make another payment of $87.92, $7.67 of that goes towards interest, $80.25 goes towards principal, leaving you a balance of $840 at 10% interest, which it just, and it calculates daily. So that's how simple interest works. It's pretty simple, right? Now, now they have fixed rates and adjustable rates. A fixed rate is 10% fixed. So most loans that most people get will be a fixed rate, which means it's a fixed rate throughout the entire term of that loan. But there's also adjustable rate loans. Primarily, the only time you'll have an adjustable rate loan as a consumer is on a mortgage. Now, as a business owner, SBA loans, a lot of SBA loans are uh, adjustable rate loans. Lines of credit are adjustable rate loans. Most of them. Some are not. Some are fixed, but most of them are adjustable. Your credit card would be a fixed interest rate, but it's compound interest. Okay. So we'll get into that here in a minute. But fixed, it can be fixed rate, simple interest, or it can be adjustable, simple interest. So for example, my SBA loan, when I got it in 2018, it was $350,000 is what I borrowed for 10 years. And the rate was 5% interest adjustable. The rate today is almost 11% interest. I am so thankful that during COVID, I continue to make the payment because the government also made the payment for me. So a lot of people stopped paying their SBA loans. I kept paying it. And now my SBA loan is almost paid off. So instead of taking 10 years to pay it off, I'll actually have it paid off in the next six to seven months. So I got that loan in 2018. Let's say I have it paid off by the end of the year. Really only took me five years to pay it off. So I paid it off in half the time because I continue to make the payments during COVID when the government was also making those payments. So it's kind of like free money. So, and I'm so thankful because it went from 5% interest to 11% interest because it was adjustable. Now let's talk about compound interest. Compound interest is interest on top of interest. So if you go and get a credit card, and you borrow $1,000 on a credit card, that's going to be amortized, which means the payment is going to be basically amortized over 20 years. So that's pretty common for credit cards. If you borrow $1,000, they're going to amortize it over 20 years. So if you make the minimum payment, it will take you approximately 15 to 20 years. That's kind of where they got it set up at. So let's see what the interest rate would be on a standard credit card. Now I'm seeing credit cards all the time at 30% interest now. So let's just put one in at 20% interest rate at 20 years. A thousand dollar credit card at 21% interest rate for amortized over 20 years, which means if you make the minimum payment, it is going to take 20 years to pay off. Your monthly payment would be $17.78. The amount of interest that you're going to pay on that thousand bucks, $3,267.20. Now think about that. You borrow a thousand dollars on your credit card 
you make the minimum payment, it's going to cost you $3,200 in just interest. Is that insane? It actually costs you more. And here's why. What I see happen on a regular basis is people will get these credit cards and they'll put a thousand, they'll max them out. They'll go shopping and they do, they got emergencies in quotes and they use their credit card to pay for the emergency instead of the, using their resourcefulness to pay for the emergency. They'll put it on a credit card and credit cards are amazing. Uh, if it wasn't for credit cards, I probably would not be in business right now because it's not on the client side, but I use credit cards every single day for to to pay for pretty much everything in my company. I pay my, sal my, my employee's salary with it. I, I pay almost everything with a credit card because I get that money for free for 30 days because I pay it off in full at the end of the month. And that's the advantage of credit cards. So let's say that you borrow the $1,000, you make the minimum payment over the next 20 years, like it's amortized, it is going to cost you $3,200. But here's what most people do. They actually go and they'll make a payment of 50 bucks. And they pay it down. And then they use it to go to Taco Bell or Burger King or Carl's Jr. or Chick-fil-A or Chipotle. And now they're essentially financing their lunch from last month. And then they make their minimum payment and then they max the credit card out again. And so instead of paying it down, where the interest is getting less and less and less, they're paying it down and then they use the card and it goes back up to a thousand. They pay it down, then they use the card and it goes back up to a thousand and they're paying the interest rate on that full thousand dollars, that compound 21% interest. And so now it's costing you five, six thousand dollars to borrow that thousand dollars. And here's why. Here's how compound interest works. You borrow the money, they charge the interest, and then the next month they charge you interest on top of the interest. And then the next month they figure, okay, this is how much you owe now. They charge interest on top of that. See, a lot of times your payment doesn't even cover all the interest. And this is what makes student loans so dangerous. And I'll get into that part here in a minute. But compound interest is you are paying interest on top of interest. So simple interest, $1,000 at 10%. If you had a balloon payment at the end of the year, you're going to pay 100 bucks. If it was compound interest, it would be thousand dollars plus the hundred dollars in interest so now you're paying interest on eleven hundred dollars see how that is different it compounds on top of itself so you're paying interest on top of interest now most loans and credit cards in america are your payment pays the interest for that month but there is one type of loan that they can legally do what's called negative amortization negative amp and that is on student loans. Our government, they, they say often that people are not above the law. Uh, you see it right now a lot with political stuff that the president's not above the law. Well, you know, sometimes they are. You know, it just depends on what your last name is. Um, but with student loans, it's the... It is illegal for any bank or any business or any person to charge and set up loans that are negative AM loans unless you're the federal government. And then it's completely legal for the federal government to do this. So let me give an example. With, or let me explain it. With student loans, you get the loan and then you have a payment. So just like on... The $1,000 simple interest loan, your payment was $79 a month. With a student loan, it would be down to like $10, $15 a month. And it's so small that it doesn't even cover the interest. So what happens is the next month, you actually owe more money on the student loan than you did the previous month. 
you make your minimum payment and then the principal goes up and now you're paying interest on the higher amount. You make your minimum payment, the interest goes up. Make your minimum payment, balance goes up. I saw this yesterday. I actually looked at a client's credit report and in 2006, 17, it was 2006 or 2007, I can't remember the year, but 16, 17 years ago, she graduated college and she took out a $2,000 student loan. She had multiple ones, but the first one I saw was $2,000. What do you think she owed right now? It's been 16, 17 years of making payments. What do you think she owes? $6,000. It has tripled in the last 16 years. Generally, it quadruples. So most student loans are set up for 20-year terms where you make a small payment that doesn't even cover the interest. So it's going up every month. It gets bigger and bigger. The payment stays the same. So now it starts compounding almost like a snowball rolling down the hill that creates an avalanche. It's the same thing, except for it's on the other side. It's in favor of the bank versus the snowball way of getting out of debt. So it started at 2000, 16 years of payments, now $6,000. And the next three years, it'll be $8,000. And then once it hits 20 years, what happens with student loans is then they re it for another 20 years on a regular interest plan. So now instead of your payment being $17, $18 a month, now it's four or $500 a month because it's four times greater. So that's called negative amortization. And you will see this on almost every student loan out there. That's why these banks absolutely love student loans. It's because here you are making the payment thinking you'll be out of debt and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So you want to avoid negative AM loans at all costs and pay off your student loans as fast as possible. So we have fixed interest rate. We have adjustable interest rate. We have compound interest and simple interest. So those are the kinds. Those are the, the types. All right. So let's pull up the next section of debt. Fees and penalties. All right. Fees and penalties. A fee would be a bounce check fee. It would be a late fee. It also could be a penalty. It could be a uh, change the payment date fee. It could be, I'll give you a great example. My motorhome caught on fire in February. Complete loss, burn up the whole thing. Took Geico three months to send me a check. Because it was a six-figure check, and it just takes a long time when, when you get those big insurance claims. I'm thankful I had full coverage, and I'm thankful that they, you know, they basically paid. I basically got a check for what I paid for the motorhome seven years ago. So actually, it was a good deal for me. And so they paid off the loan, and I called the bank to close that account because it was a, a small credit union somewhere in Nevada, and, I, you know, I don't need it. And there was like $25 left over. So I said, I'd like to close it. And they're like, okay, um, we'll mail you a cashier's check. But the fee to mail your check is $15. So they literally charged me $15 to mail me a check for my $25 that I had overpaid. So I got a check for $10 because of the $15 fee. So they'll charge you check cashing fees. Wells Fargo charges you a fee if you deposit cash. If you go to ATM, they charge you a fee to pull money out. If you do cash advances, they have overdraft protection fees. They have bounce check fees or NSFs, insufficient fund fees. They have monthly servicing fees. The banks will fee you to death and penalize you to death. They make billions of dollars off of these fees. You would think that the bank doesn't want you to write checks that you don't have money to cover. 
And the banks actually are happy to cash those checks and process those checks because now they get to charge you a $35 NSF fee. And it was, um, I think it was, it was either Bank of America or I think it's Bank of America. During COVID, during the pandemic, um, the government said you cannot charge these overdraft fees. And the banks cried and said, well, how are we going to pay for our bills? And what are we going to do? So the government gave them billions of dollars of our money, taxpayer money. But the government gave them billions of dollars and said, you cannot charge overdraft fees during this time. Well, guess what Bank of America did? They, could, they just kept charging the overdraft fees anyway. So they were double dipping. They got money from Uncle Sam to not charge fees and they got money from the clients. And that's just how banks work. You know, they're in bed with the politicians. That's just how our system is set up. I don't think most people realize how expensive those NSF fees are. They rack up. And I see checking accounts or bank statements from from clients, they, they pay over $1,000 a month, some of them, in just fees, NSF fees and all the rest of the fees. So you really got to watch the fees that the banks are charging you and the penalties because it's, it's cash cow for the banks. Now, with that, I'll, I'll tell you how we use it. I own a few apartment complexes, and I think we're up to about 4,000 tenants now. And... We charge a late fee if someone pays rent late. It's reasonable, right? If your rent is due on the 1st and you pay rent on the 10th, there's a late fee. We actually don't mind when our tenants pay two, three days late. The late fee, I, I don't know, it's like 25, 30 bucks. And, you know, rent might be $1,500. We charge $30 if you pay on the third versus the first because you're bad with your, with your money and you just pay late due to laziness or whatever. With an apartment complex, that $30 to us is worth $3,000 in equity on the apartment because they're paying $30 more. It's a hundred time multiplier for the apartment. So it literally makes the apartment complex worth $3,000 more because the person's paying an extra $30 in fees. Isn't that crazy? We figured that out as well with pet rental. We charge pet rent. So instead of charging a, a deposit that by law we have to give back, a portion of it, we just charge pet rent. So if you live into move into one of our apartments and you have a cat, I think it's like 30 bucks for a cat. And if you have a dog under so many pounds, it's 40, 40, 50 bucks for your dog in rent. That makes our apartment complex worth way more than if we didn't charge the rent. So those are some examples of fees and you gotta be careful with that. So we got annual fees, balance transfer fees, prepayment penalties, which very few loans have prepayment penalties, but they're out there. Uh, the loan on my Ferrari had a two-year prepayment penalty, and it was 1% of the, um, the total. So it was pretty expensive. So, But most loans don't have prepayment penalties, but some do. So you just got to check it. And it's the personal loans generally don't have prepayment penalties, but the business loans will have them. So, all right, let's pull up the next section. And that was, um, I think it's the toll. My hat is messing with my glasses. <laughs> all right, credit scores and financial opportunities. Money Magazine did a study. Um, it's probably been 10 years now that they did this study. And it said the average American with less than good credit, so less than 740 credit, would pay $4,200 a year extra due to their poor credit score. They didn't have bad credit, just due to poor credit score. Um, I, I saw a credit report this morning. Lady called me. Used to be in the 800s. Now she's 616. Why is she 616? Because she's closed all her credit cards. Lost 200 points by just closing all her credit cards. Now she's got to rebuild. So that's an example. If 
of losing money and paying a higher interest rate due to a poor credit score. She doesn't have bad credit. There's no late penalties, nothing. It's simply a poor credit score due to closing her credit cards. A lot of times we see it because they maxed out their credit cards, which is a better problem to have than closing the credit card because you just pay off the credit card and your score goes back up. But they did this study and they said the average American would lose or uh, would lose out on $4,200 a year. So it either cost them $350 a month in extra fees, penalties, interest, or they'd lose out on $350. So for example, I have a credit card that if I took my phone right now and I smashed it on my metal desk here and shattered this screen, they would pay for me to have a new phone. And I don't have to pay anything for it. I don't have insurance on the phone. It's through my American Express. Or the camera that's in front of me. If it got knocked over and broke, I could file a claim with American Express and they would give me a new camera up to $10,000 because it's built into the credit card. Now, in order to have that type of credit card, you have to have good credit. So this is an example of how bad credit could cost you money. Not just the interest rate, but in missed opportunities. Give you another example. In April, I flew to New Orleans and they canceled my flight and they did it five times. Five times they canceled my flight. I finally got tired of it. I wanted to get home. They were going to make me spend the night in the airport in Dallas. And I'm like, forget this. I just went, I booked another flight and I flew home on a different airline. My mistake was I just didn't do it the first time they canceled the flight. I waited around for about four or five hours. Um, but I filed a claim with American Express and I got a check for $2,500 because my flight had been canceled five times. And inside my American Express, part of the benefits are they will refund me. So I got 2,500 bucks. And I got the money back from American Airlines for the ticket that they had canceled five times. And so there's that could have cost me $2,500 if I did not have that American Express. So that's some of the ways that you can lose money. Here's another way. I got presented an opportunity today to buy a two-bedroom, two-bath, condo in Boca Raton, Florida on the water for $165,000 in a resort, a really nice resort. I don't know if it's a five star, but I know it's at least a four star. Think about that. A two bedroom, two bath condo on the water, on the ocean in Boca Raton, which is just north of Miami, for $165,000. Is that insane? Now, why so cheap? It should be selling for well over a million, maybe even $2 million. Because the HOA fees are $36,000 a year, and the club fee is $80,000 a year. So to live there, you have to pay $120,000 a year in fees, but you get the condo for $165,000. Now, do you think that's worth it for me? I think so. And if I had bad credit and I didn't have access to that money, I could lose that opportunity to buy that. Now, in your case, you might lose the opportunity to buy a house at a good deal. You might lose the opportunity to get interest rate. Think about this. I looked it up and from March 2020 until December 2022, we had over 5,000 people that we talked to on the phone that wanted to buy a house, that wanted to think about hiring us to fix their credit. They wanted to think about it. 5,000 people. So that's 5,000 people now that didn't hire us. And because they didn't hire us to fix their credit, they're not getting 3% interest loans. They're at 6 and 7% interest now. Think about the cost because they wanted to think about it instead of just paying us the $99 to get started and get their credit fixed. 
and then pay us back after we fixed it. They lost out on that. So there's, there's literally money that you could lose by having too much debt. And too much debt can drive down your credit score. So you not only are paying money out, but you're losing money and you're not able to buy things. So that actually is one of the pitfalls of debt is not having the ability to get these great opportunities. And I will tell you this. I believe that we are headed into even a much greater recession than we're at now. I don't think people are realizing how much is going to go on sale. A year ago, a year and a half ago, I was in the, in the uh, market to buy a four-door four, four side-by-side, a Polaris Razor. So I don't know if you've seen these, but they're basically like souped-up doom buggies. And you can drive them on the road in certain states. Here in Idaho, you can drive them on the road. But they're, uh, they're basically a roll cage with a motor, transmission, and some plastic doors, if it even has doors. Some of them don't even have roofs. Do 100 miles an hour in them. They're insane. You could not find one for sale a year ago. And then they started hitting the market 40,000, 50,000, 35,000. Today, I'm seeing them now on Facebook Marketplace, 20,000, 18,000. People are starting to dump their toys because they went and bought these toys and now they can't make their mortgage payment, their car payment, or they can't make the payment on the side by side. So they're dumping stuff. So there's a lot of opportunity out there and there's going to be even more opportunity in the future if you get your money and your credit right. So pull up, the, let's pull up the next one. Psychological and emotional toll. This is a really interesting thing. I have a friend, his name's Ed Milet, and you might know Ed. He's he's got a very popular podcast called the Ed Milet Show. In fact, it's the number one rated podcast on the planet uh, for personal development. He coaches athletes and movie stars and presidents and prime ministers. And uh, he's a close friend of mine. And I remember sitting down with him at his house in Coeur d'Alene and we were talking about investing and money and stuff and he asked me how i got involved with with uh my apartment complexes and i told him that i had known grant cardone and i was hanging out with grant and i just didn't like the way grant did his business and so um, i went and found someone else and i sold my house in tahoe i made a little over a million dollars off that house and i took all of it minus a thousand bucks and I put it all in an apartment complex. And Ed about lost it. He says, I could never do that. Like, it would cause me so much anxiety that I'd have a heart attack. Like, I could not do that. Ed is worth $400 million or so. And he's probably got $120, $150 million in just real estate that he paid cash for. He doesn't use debt. And him and I have had conversations on this. Like, if you use debt, Ed, you would be worth billions of dollars right now instead of $400 million. And he said, if I use debt, I wouldn't be worth $400 million because I can't emotionally handle it. Psychologically, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I wouldn't be able to perform. I wouldn't be able to help my clients. So it doesn't work for me. And I respect that. And I used to be the guy that was more like the, um, Robert Kiyosaki. Maximize your debt, get as much money as you can from the banks, borrow all the money from investors for your down payments. And then over the last couple of years, I've started to slowly change where the debt had a little bit more emotional impact on me, a little psychological where I started worrying a little bit about my debt and I have millions of dollars in debt and I got a handle on it. Um, it helped with the motorhome because that was part of the debt and that that's gone. Now I'm selling my airplane. My Ferrari's almost paid off. My $350,000 SBA loan is almost paid off and I got debt on my house. Um, and I, I don't think I'll pay that off early because it's 3% fixed rate, but you need to figure out what works for you. And if you're one of those people that 
debt is going to psychologically impede your emotional state, then don't do it. But if you can handle a little bit of debt and you can save up enough money to buy a rental property, Airbnb it, or just do a regular rental, and you can handle the pressure of having to make that payment, then use it. It's okay, but do whatever works best for you. I don't like those blanket statements like Dave Ramsey's probably the worst at this. All, all debt's bad. I think he says there's no such thing as good debt. Well, I disagree. You know, there is good debt. Um, and I think that if you can finance, if you can emotionally handle the pressure of having the payments, it's great. Uh, my brother, he can't handle debt. My mom can't handle debt. And so I like using automatic payments. I like bill pay. So I don't write checks. I don't have to like go through my bills, open it up, and then write a check. Even when money was tight for me, I still didn't do that. I set everything up on automatic payments, and I recommend that you do that as well, at least for the minimum payments on your debt. That way it relieves that stressor, that stressor, the pressure and stress, not stressor, the stress and the, the stress and the pressure it relieves that if you have automatic payments, then you don't have to worry about it so much. So there is a psychological toll to debt for some people. And I believe that debt, financial problems, are the number one cause of death in America, the number one cause of marriage failure in America as well. And here's why. If you have money problems, which is caused from debt or poor management of your money, then you have credit problems, you're stressed at home. And when you're stressed, you tend to fight with your spouse more. I don't know about you, but like today, I, I realized today I had two cups of coffee, an energy drink, and a big Starbucks coffee. And it wasn't until I got that big Starbucks coffee that I found myself getting really irritable. I'm not in a bad mood. Nobody did anything wrong, but little things started to bother me. And I was like, it's the coffee. It's the caffeine. I had too much caffeine. I'm on edge. And I think that's the same thing that happens when you have the debt that's uncontrollable that you haven't managed yet is it puts you on edge. And if you're on edge and your spouse is on edge, you're now rubbing against each other and you're fighting, you're picking at them. And eventually you start picking and it starts separating you. Next thing you know, you're divorced, which causes more financial problems. Because now there's two households. The government loves divorce. Absolutely loves it when people get divorced. Real estate people love divorce. Banks love divorce. They absolutely love it. Why? Because now there's two households. The city, the county, the state, they love divorce. Because now instead of husband and wife living in one home, paying property tax on one home, husband and wife are now living in two homes, divorced. They're paying property tax on two homes. So that works. And because they got divorced, what used to be a stay-at-home parent is now working. So the government absolutely loves splitting up families. Part of the reason they teach our kids the way they teach is they want broken homes. So I think if we can get our money right, our credit right, our taxes right, it could literally save marriages and then save homes and eventually save lives because stress causes inflammation. What causes stress? Financial problems. You get stress, you have inflammation. What's inflammation do? Causes heart problems. Causes aneurysm. Causes strokes. Then people binge eat. They become diabetic. They're overweight. Now once they get overweight 
and stress creates more cortisol which makes you gain even more weight and it just starts spiraling out of control all because of debt and not managing your debt the right way all of us all of us have cancer inside of our bodies right now right now all of us have cancer the difference is most of us our bodies are killing the cancer and removing it every day but when you're under stress and you have inflammation you're not eating right due to maybe the stress or the financial problems it starts compounding again and it just spirals so i believe this is one of the tolls of not controlling your debt is early death and stress and aging here's what you can do so i went over what i believe on it and i went over the psychological and emotional toll what can you do what i've seen from people when i used to go out to their homes and do financial coaching at their homes was they would have a stack of mail and by not opening that mail they don't open it because they think i don't want to look at it and get stressed out so they leave it sitting there the problem is by leaving it sitting there it causes more stress on the back end because they know something's in there. So here's what I recommend to do with your debt. Number one, you need to know what you owe. Now you can write it down on a piece of paper. You can do a spreadsheet. You can buy a software for it. And if you want to really rapidly get rid of your debt, we have a software that we finance. It's $99 a month. It will take your 30-year mortgage and have it completely paid off in 7 to 10 years without refinancing, without making extra payments. If you have student loans, same thing. Car loans, same thing. Credit cards, same thing. It wipes that debt out. It eliminates 70% of the interest by just understanding how money works and where you deposit it. So if you are interested in that debt reduction software and you want to know more information, let me know and I'll send you more information on it. With that, you need to know what your debt is. Because if you don't know exactly, and most people I talk to have no, have no idea how much money they owe. I'm sitting there, I'm talking to them. And I'm like, all right, how much debt you got? No, oh, I'm debt free. Okay, let's get into it. Got any credit cards? Well, yeah. Car loans? Yeah. Mortgage? Yeah. Student loans? Yeah. Medical bills? Yeah. Collection? Yeah. Guess they're not debt free, are they? But most people think they are, or they think it's under control because they ignore it. So the first thing you need to do is write down how much debt you have. And you should have a, I like spreadsheets, but you can do whatever. The list of the debt, how much you owe in the debt, what the interest rate is on the debt, and how much the payment is. And then pay off the debt based on the amount owed, not the interest rate. You always start with the lowest balance owed so you get some momentum when you're paying off that debt. And then just slowly start paying it. Now, if you can't make all your payments, pick one that you're going to make. My favorite book of all times for financials is called The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon. By far, hands down, my favorite book on finances. I read it every single year. And I like it because it's a simple way to pay off your debt. And maybe we'll do a whole class on just the richest man in Babylon strategies. But what you can do is once you list your debt and figure out how much you owe, you then can start contacting some of your creditors and making payments but the key is to pay yourself first because if you continue just to pay your debt and you never put any money aside for you you're eventually going to quit paying your debt debtors because you're like why am i doing all this work i'm just working to pay everybody else so put a little bit aside for yourself but the key to getting out of debt is to know how much debt you owe and then start strategizing and paying off the smallest of that first. So that's the emotional and psychological tolls of debt. And it can be overwhelming. Absolutely. 
I'm trying to say the word and I think I'm going to screw it up. Del yeah, I'm not even going to try. There are some words I just can't say. And I, I don't know what it's, I don't know what it is, but I just can't say it. Del D, um, I don't know. It's in my head. I can't think how to say it. <laughs> so we'll skip that word. But it, it can par be paralyzing. The debt can literally be paralyzing. And so you need to just address it, acknowledge it, and figure out how if you can pay it. And if you can't, then just acknowledge you can't pay it. And we'll figure out, figure something out. So I don't want you to get so overwhelmed on your debt that... Um, you hurt yourself and a lot of people do. I mean, th the whole reason I have this company today is because my little brother killed himself over a little tiny bit of debt when he was 26 years old. He had a little bit of financial problems, which caused him to fight with his girlfriend. They got in a fight. They broke up. He shot himself. It's horrible. Absolutely horrible. That, you know, he ended his life at 26 years old for less money than than um, I've spent on dinners before. But it was so much to him. It was overwhelming to him. Paralyzed him. And when he lost his girlfriend over it, that was it. That was the final straw. So I don't want people to do that. So if, if you're getting to that point, give us a call. That's what we do all day long is we help people with their money, credit, and taxes, and debt. All right? So that's the emotional toll and the psychological toll of debt. All right, let's get into the next thing. Legal and solutions. So again, I want to provide you with the problem and then we're going to give you this solution, okay? So legal, you're going to start seeing a lot more banks suing and collection companies suing on debt that they've been ignoring for the last 10 years or so. We're already seeing it. The banks are scrambling. Banks are going out of business. You know, during 2008 crash, we had, I, don't, I can't remember, it was 100 something banks that failed. And it was like $300 billion total. Uh, we've already had three banks fail this year alone, and it's already over 400, $450 billion of lost money lost in quotations because you know the government bails out the banks and they bails out the people with money in the bank it wasn't really lost but it you know people lost their job for sure and so banks are starting to sue and i'm seeing banks sue as little as 500 dollars owed there is no statute of limitations whatsoever on debt none you will owe that money to the rest of your life until you die pay it or file bankruptcy and even when you die, sometimes it goes to your estate and your kids have to pay the debt. Depends on where you live. There is no statute of limitations on debt. Statute of limitations on whether or not they can sue you. And in most states, it's between four and seven years. If they sue you, they can garnish you and they can levy your bank accounts and put liens on everything you own, including your cars, your houses, and in some states, your retirement accounts. So you got to be really careful with this debt because if you just ignore it, it can come back and cost you a lot of money. And I didn't bring up debt owed to the IRS because if you're not paying your taxes, worse yet, your employer tax if you have employees, that can get really expensive with fees, interest, and penalties. So if you owe more than $1,000 right now, whether it's collection, an old charge off, most likely nine times out of 10, you're going to get sued on it now because banks are suing 90% of the time if you owe more than $1,000. And they're suing because they know if they sue you and they pay the filing fee, the attorney, the service fee, that they're going to get a default judgment from you because you most likely will not go to court because you don't want to deal with the stress. You might not even get served. They might mail you a letter. They might not do anything. They might not even tell you about the court date. 
And then you wake up one morning, all the money in your bank account's gone. I've had this happen to me. It's been a while. Uh, it happened to me in 2005 to 2008 constantly. And I learned how to make it stop uh, through opening different bank accounts. And I knew, learned a strategy on that. And eventually I got it all fixed. I've, I've woke up before and I got my paycheck and half my money's gone due to garnishment. That sucks because how are you going to pay your bills if they levy your bank account and they garnish your wages? And once they levy your bank account or garnish your wages, you can't stop it unless you file bankruptcy. That's the only way to stop it. You pay it or you file bankruptcy once they've sued you. So if you have debt right now for more than $1,000, you need to contact my office so we can put you in touch with our law firms and our paralegal so we can settle that debt for you. And next week, I'll talk how debt settlement works and how the process works. But in the meantime, if you owe more than $1,000, contact the office so we can get you in touch with Tina, our paralegal, and get that debt settled before they sue you. Because once they sue you, there's not a lot you can do because they've already got the court to stamp it, to rubber stamp it. You owe it. They can now legally garnish your wages and levy your bank accounts. Now, each, each state has a little bit different rules. Uh, I'll give you an example. In Florida, they can't garnish your wages if you are the, um, the main uh, the the main breadwinner for the family. So if most of the money's from you, so if you're married, let's say that the husband makes more money than the wife and they garnish the husband and he makes more than the wife, well, they can't legally garnish you. And so we get those garnishments reversed all the time and stopped because they still do it. The courts allow it because the client, our client did not go to court and dispute the garnishment. So if you don't go and stand up for your rights, the courts don't care. They just rubber stamp it because they make millions upon millions of dollars in filing fees. California alone makes almost $10 million a year in bogus filing fees. $10 million just in fees, allowing collection companies to sue Poor people, because they're not suing the wealthy, because the wealthy have attorneys and they stop it and they fix it. But they're suing the working poor and the government doesn't care because it's all about dollars for them. So don't wait until it's too late to stop the lawsuit. So if you owe more than a thousand bucks, give us a call. We'll help you out as much as we can. All right. I think that's a wrap for tonight as far as the section, but let's go through some Q&A. I see some comments over there. I just can't read them. It's too far away. Here we go. On the water, foreclosure. It's not a foreclosure. It's um, the person just doesn't want to pay it anymore. They just don't want to pay the $110,000 or $112,000 in HOA fees and club fees. I know that seems like a lot, guys, for the fees. Uh, and it is a lot. Believe me, it's a lot. But if you're a Florida resident, you pay no income tax. So when you make a lot of money and you pay no income tax, it pays for the fees. It's pretty simple. That's why a lot of people are leaving California that has 13% income tax. And they exchange it to Florida that has zero income tax. So if you're like my friend Ed Milet, who makes $30 million a year, well, He's paying $5 million a year, roughly, in income tax to the state of California. If he would move to Florida, he's saving $5 million a year. So that's what we're looking at, which is the condo. Any other comments on, or questions on there, Chastity, or is it just comments? Can't quite see him. It's too far. Is that it, Chastney? Earlier we started this and Chastney had to interrupt me. She's like, I forgot to hit the live button. So we were having technical issues. She just moved into a new apartment. So maybe 
I cannot see it. That's it so far. Okay. All right, guys. Look, if you don't have any Q&A, that's cool. If you got over $1,000 and you want to get that settled, reach out to the office tomorrow. And if you have debt that you want to help get rid of faster, like through your mortgage, student loans, car loans, through our debt reduction software, uh, reach out as well and we'll get you introduced to the software and we'll explain how that works. Okay. I will see all of you next uh, next Tuesday. Have a good day.